the greatest desire for Christ for each and every single one of us is to get to a place where we love him with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our souls, with all of our strength. The outpouring of this would be that we would love others as ourselves. The Lord wants to know why you don't love yourself. What have you put before him? Because whatever gets placed in front of him, you end up looking internal. You look at yourself. And you oftentimes don't find anything lovely without Christ. Christ wants to be elevated in your life. This is my vitamin water. I drink it every day. Supposedly, it's supposed to keep me healthy. It tastes good. I enjoy this. I know that in this are all the vitamins and minerals that my body needs, including selenium, to be healthy. It's my insurance plan instead of Obamacare. It's good. It tastes good. I know it's good for me. I really like this. It's like Christ. He's good. He has everything that you need. Yes, thank you. Everything that your spirit desires. Everything that your heart desires. And I like coffee. Amen. And it's good and it's warm. I don't know how many nutrients it has in it, but it's got caffeine, which for a brief moment makes me feel good, energized, but it doesn't last. This is good, it lasts, sustained energy throughout the day, kind of just a bump. We live our lives like this with Christ. Oh Lord, I love you. Mm. You're so good. I want a drink of you. So wonderful. But I'm going to go sin a little bit. I'm just going to do this just for a little while, just for that satisfaction of the flesh, just for a moment. Oh, but Lord, I do love you. Let me have another drink of you. On, and we live our lives this way. Where we have Christ. Christ. And we have all of his goodness and all of his joy, but we indulge. I love you, Lord, but I hate him. I love you, Lord. You're so amazing. You're all my provision. I need more money. Doubt. We live our lives this way. To the Lord, this is good, amen? This is our indulgence. And we live our lives with Christ in sin. Pretty disgusting, isn't it? <laughs> Can you find happiness in this? Yet this is what God's people drink all the time. They have the opportunity to drink pure from him, from his wellspring, from his waters, his sustenance, his power in your life. And yet we choose all kinds of other things. And just pour it in, drink it down, and wonder why it's not satisfying. If you're here today and you've been drinking of this type of water, you can stop today. I know I'm going to. The Lord wants you to be free. The Lord wants you to be alive. And you can't live your life that way because there's no joy in it. There's no happiness. There's no satisfaction. You know what's amazing? Is that when you realize that you're living your life that way, you can stop. You can repent. You can ask God for forgiveness. You can ask him for cleansing. And
and you can drink of him in abundance. And he will continue to pour out and pour out and pour out into your life. But we've got to do away with all this. Because we, although I like coffee and we'll probably continue drinking it. I don't want sin in my life. I don't want to think that I can drink of him and drink of the world and find satisfaction. I want to go in prayer. It's just as you're sitting there, I just want you to reflect. Just reflect what it is in your life that you've poured into your cup of blessing of the Lord. What is it that you've placed in your cup of God's grace and mercy, of his abundance? Because it's not satisfying. You have a longing. That longing is for the truth of the Lord. Amen? Our precious Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your presence. Thank you for an understanding that you are our God, that you are gloriously lifted up and on high in your throne in heaven. Lord, at times we take our eyes off you. And we place them on other things in this world, including ourselves. And we feel pain and heartache, distress and discouragement. Oh God, that we would just put our eyes on you. And let the things of this world fade away as you fill us more and more with your goodness, with your blessings, with your life. In your heart speaking to God, there's a place where you need to repent and ask for forgiveness. He knows your thoughts. He can see through you as if you're transparent. Nothing can hide who you are from him. Speak to him. Ask him to cleanse you. To renew a right spirit within you. To lead you in the everlasting. And Lord, because we know you are faithful, because you are true, because you are all powerful, these things are done in your mighty and precious name, the name above every name, the name of Jesus Christ. And God's people will say, amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lamb. He's good to us, is he not? He's so good to us. Turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. I got to thinking about what we do as a church and, and what we do as God's people and what we're designed to do as God's people. Amen. Thank you, brother. I got to thinking about, strangely enough, a car manufacturer. Can anyone tell me what a car manufacturer makes? What's that? Okay, I made that one easy. Now let's get a little bit harder. I was thinking about a bakery. What do they make? Pastries, bread. Somebody said bakers. Some schools. They do. That's good. An ice cream shop, although it's a little cool out there for ice cream, still tastes good. When you go to an ice cream shop, what do you expect to see? Ice cream? Sounds pretty common, doesn't it? 
So, what do disciples make? So, if you saw a car manufacturer and they weren't producing cars, would it really be a car manufacturer? Or would it be a facility that housed parts for cars? A bakery that doesn't make bread, but has a bunch of dough? Is it a bakery? You go to an ice cream shop and there's no ice cream. Is it really an ice cream shop? If you see a disciple that's not making disciples, is he a disciple? I paused for a long time there just to let it sink in. Disciples make disciples. All throughout scripture, we see disciples making disciples. God doesn't need you to come here today. God doesn't need anything from you. God is perfect without you. God doesn't need your love. He doesn't need your adoration. He doesn't need your false witness. He doesn't need your blasphemous words from your mouth with a hard heart. He doesn't need your sincere praise. Our God lacks nothing. He is in himself love, wherefore he does not need love. He is not a beggar begging anyone to come and receive him. He is the Lord God Almighty, and we are in desperate need of him, not him in need of us. And when he came down from heaven because we couldn't save ourselves and he humbled himself in the form of a man and took on all of our sins upon himself, died the death that we deserved, he did that because of his love for us, not our love for him. We hated him. As a matter of fact, we still hate him at times. We blame him for things in our life as if we won't take responsibility for our own actions. What I'm saying is, God is amazing. He is all powerful and he needs and lacks nothing. Nothing. So when we come to gather as Christ's body, why do we come? What are we coming for? Why do we come together? To love him, to honor him. Because what he has already done for us. And because of that great love, there's something that we would do that would just become part of our nature because we have been forgiven. By the way, you've been forgiven. If you're a child of the Most High God, you've given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, you have been forgiven. Past, present, future, all of it, done, done away with. There is no condemnation, wherefore, in Jesus Christ. This is what the Bible says. If you feel condemned about something, it's from Satan. If you feel convicted over something, that's the Holy Spirit. And praise God that we have conviction in our life where the Holy Spirit takes residence in us and that we get convicted over things that we want to make right. Any good to do that? I'm not trying to be too hard on anybody here. I just want us to have a proper perspective of God. He loves us more than we love him. He loves us more than we love him. And we want to be more like our Savior who had a great love for him. Amen? So are we following Christ as his disciples or are we following our feelings, our emotions? Do we follow Christ as disciples or do we follow our careers? Do we follow our families? None of those things are bad in and of themselves. But if we're not following after Christ, what are we doing? What is the point of us saying that we're disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ 
yet we don't follow our Savior. I would just assume that you would live your life in the world and soak in as much of this world as you can and get as many material things as you can and go to hell than to fake your walk with God trying to live a chaste and seemingly humble life and go to hell. What does it matter when the outcome is death? To live our lives for Christ. Is he worthy? Anyone? He's worthy. So, so what gets in our spirits that we would focus on anything other than him, considering who he is? Now, I think he's a loving God for all that he's done. And he loves us even though when we make mistakes, he's still there for us. He'll never leave us and he'll never forsake us. Is that not amazing? There's many times I've done stuff I wanted to leave me. I don't know about you. <laughs> Try to get away from me. You ever been there? He didn't go anywhere. That's a good father, amen? That's a good father. In, in Matthew chapter 4, Lord Jesus Christ comes upon a couple of men, beginning in verse 18. And the message that, that Christ is preaching at this moment is repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent for living your life for you. Living your life about check boxes instead of a relationship with the almighty God. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's that close. It's right here. Has anybody ever been in a place where you... <clears throat> felt like there was no weight on your back at all, that the Lord had removed all of that, and all of a sudden you had clarity of thought, and there was power and zeal in your voice, and, and it didn't seem like whatever happened in somebody else's life that you could speak a word of knowledge into their life, and all of a sudden you would see them transform, and then you just go from place to place and everywhere you went, and that zeal kept building up in you. There were no problems that couldn't be handled. There's no obstacle that couldn't be tackled. Have you ever been there? Do you remember that? It's powerful, isn't it? That's what God wants for us. All the time. And we choose other things to step in the way, to bring that, to bring that out, to bring that down. So the Lord's saying, repent. For the kingdom of heaven is close. It's right there. You can have that back. You can have it right now. All it takes is repentance. Saying, nope, I'm done. I'm done with that. And repentance is a twofold thing. It's turning from something to something. I'm turning from this, my ways, to your ways. Amen? About face. About face. Amen. It's an about face. I like that. So the Lord comes up on these, uh, these couple of men that are, that are doing their job and, and living their life. And these are fairly religious folk. I mean, you know, they, they know the word of the time and, and they're trying to do some things that are right, but they've got some coffee in their vitamin water. <laughs> and he says unto them in verse 19, Jesus is walking by the sea of Galilee. He sees this too, Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brother, Casting nets in the sea. They were fishers. And he says unto them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Right out of the gate, the first call. After repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. What is our role if we were Peter and Andrew? What does he say? Follow. Anything else? follow. Follow me and I'm going to do something. You follow me and I will make you disciples. I will make you fishers of men. Disciples make disciples. And right out of the gate, he calls them to follow him. And if you're following him, the natural thing that's going to happen are that disciples are going to be made. 
you will become a fisher of men. A fisher of men. Nothing brings me more joy and excitement in my life than to see someone come to faith in Christ. I will stay up late. I will get up early. I will drive hours to get there if there is the the prospect of someone coming to faith in Christ. (laughs) And to see them from that point on, as you minister into their lives and see them grow, to see that disciple, I'll tell you what, there's nothing more rewarding than to see a disciple making disciples. There is nothing more rewarding in this life than to see someone that you have, that you have taken as, 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 as a, a son in the faith, if you will, a brother for sure or a sister, And to see them going out or calling you and saying, I led another brother to the Lord. He's coming over to the house tomorrow night. And we're going to be going over scripture. Can you come over? (laughs) Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. It's beautiful, isn't it? Matthew, Mark, next book over. Mark chapter 10. The church today and the people in the church have gotten to a place where they have gotten very comfortable with a form of the gospel that, that uh, uh, doesn't require sacrifice. I come to church, I leave church, I go about my day every day, and every once in a while, I'll mention Jesus But if we're honest with ourselves, there's more times that we know we should speak Christ's name into the situation and we don't. We have no real interest in making disciples because in that moment, we're following our agenda, our schedule, our needs, our greeds, instead of following Jesus Christ. To follow Jesus Christ is something that we would do every moment, every day but I may lose my job, then lose it. Get another job. I know that's harsh. I'll tell you right now, we're in a world that is dying and going to hell. And the only answer to death is Jesus Christ. If I had a job that told me I couldn't minister, I wouldn't take it. That's just me. And I proved that out in my own life. We always wonder, what would I do if I came into this situation? I know what I would do. Bye-bye. Have a great day. Before I leave, I'm going to tell you all about Jesus until you call the police and kick me out. No. (laughs) Now that I'm at that place. I'm just saying, following him is something that we do all the time. He gives some some, uh, guidelines to what a disciple is. He kind of shows us. The Lord Jesus Christ tells us what a disciple is. So when we look in Mark chapter 10 and and we begin to look in uh, verse 17, I've shared this before, but listen to this. This is Jesus Christ himself who is the disciple maker, amen? Amen. If there was ever a disciple maker, it's going to be the Lord Jesus Christ. And, And he says things like, hey, just add me to your life. I know that you've got all kinds of stuff, but I want to bless you. Well, most people, by the way, are very selfish, are they not? They're very greedy and about themselves, self-centered, self-hearted. It's all about me, me, me. As a matter of fact, the Lord says, I've got a, as I read here in Mark chapter 10, he says, I've got a plan for your life. And this guy goes, really? I've got a plan for me too. Isn't that wonderful that God wants to have plans for me too? That I love you. You love me? I love me too. How wonderful is this? That God can love me more than I love me? No. But the gospel that we share today sometimes is just like that. There's no conviction of anything in their life. And 
Just adding Christ to someone's life is not making a disciple. It's making a false convert. It's making somebody who prays a prayer and goes to hell thinking that they're saved. And there will be a time when Christ says, get away from me, you worker of iniquity. And these men and women that stand before the Lord say, did I not cast out demons in your name? Did I not do many wonderful works in your name? I never knew you. Get away from me, you worker of iniquity. You don't want to make that kind of disciple, do you? No. Churches today are making those kind of disciples every day, all the time. I was one for a period of time, a false convert. Somebody who lived with coffee in their vitamin water every day, all the time, mainly coffee, saying, I'm a believer. To other people, you know what I was? Pharisee. Here's what the Lord says to a man who comes to him asking for salvation. He says, and when he uh, was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeling to him and asked, good master, what shall I do to inherit the kingdom? What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Isn't that awesome? That's the way you make a disciple. Somebody coming up to you and saying, please, how do I find out how to have eternal life? I mean, this is, a, this is like what we pray for, right? Like somebody come to me, don't make me go to you, and come down and look very worshipful that you need eternal life. And then I'm going to share with you how you can add Jesus to it, right? That's ideal, Here's what the Lord says. Why do you call me good? There on your knees, asking for eternal life. Why? Why do you say I'm good? There is none good but one, that's God. So instead of saying, let me add me to your life. Let me tell you how much I love you even more than you love yourself. He says, you know the commandments, don't commit adultery, don't kill, don't steal, don't bear false witness, don't defraud, honor your father and your mother. And I love this. Then Jesus beholding him, he's saying this. He's saying, don't do these things. It says that Jesus beholding him loved him. Loved him. How much love do we show somebody when we help them to be a false convert, a false disciple. Beholding them, he loved them, and he said, one thing that thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever you have, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up your cross, and what? Follow me. Then follow me. Go and sell everything that you've got. And he was sad, as you can imagine, as many of we would actually be, if the Lord Jesus Christ himself appeared to you and said, go sell everything that you have, give it to the poor, take up your cross, come and follow me. Would we do it? It says here that he was sad at the saying and went away, grieved, for he had great possessions. He goes on to say, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. Wow, Jesus, you need an evangelism course. <laughs> right? I mean, you need to go to Operation Go or, or talk with uh, Ray Comfort. And, and I mean, you, you, need some, you need some work here. We had the perfect opportunity to get a man who had a lot of money into our cause. Talk to so many pastors that are so fearful to tell people the truth because they're going to hurt the feelings of somebody who's got some money so that they can make their budget, pay for their building 
fund their programs. Afraid to share the truth. I think Jesus might have it right. Amen. Amen. What is a disciple? A learner. a learner. Amen. A learner. So come with me. We're in Matthew. We went to Mark and now Luke. Matthew, Mark, Luke. We're just going through the books here. Luke chapter 9. The Lord tells him to sell everything. What if this man would have turned in that moment, stood up from his knees and said, yes, Lord, I will, because I want to follow you. And I want, I want what you have. I'll be right back. Don't, are you going to be here? Are you going over there? Are you going to be over by the Sea of Galilee, Tiberias in that area? I'll be there. I'm coming. What would what would the Lord have said at that moment in time? Why don't you come with me? We're going to run into some poor folk. And we can do it there. Right? It was his attachment, his covetousness, his attachment to stuff that was the problem. I have followed everything else since my youth. I don't sin. That's what he was saying. (laughs) He said, oh, just one thing that you lack. Just one, just one small thing. Go sell everything that you have. Come and follow me. So he was basically saying, are you following me and making me preeminent in your life? Or is something else, is something else taking my place? If there's anything else that's taking the place of Christ in your life, we have to get rid of it. Here's what the Lord says in in Luke chapter 9. This is an amazing thing. It says, um, and it came to pass, this is kind of like a... (laughs) This is true evangelism. It's an amazing thing how the Lord actually speaks to people. And it came to pass, verse 57, and it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will what? Follow thee. 57, follow thee wherever you go. Anybody made that statement before? I will follow you wherever you go, wherever you send me, whatever you tell me, I'm going to do it. And Jesus says, That's wonderful. I'm so glad to hear that. No, he says, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. When you follow me, you may be homeless. Is that okay? I don't know about this homeless thing, Lord. That's pretty rough. I mean, sell everything, be homeless, and follow you? Ow. Let's see how the next guy does. He says unto another, follow me. There it is, follow me. And he said, Lord, suffer me go uh, first to go and bury my father. This seems reasonable, amen? I want to follow you. My dad just passed away. My dad passed away three years ago, four, uh, five years ago now. My goodness. I was there at the funeral. It was something that I, I really, really felt I had to go to, Amen really had to be there. So, so surely the Lord's going to understand, right? It's my dad. And Jesus says to him, let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. No. No. Let the dead bury the dead. You go and you preach the kingdom of God. What? Sell everything? Homeless? Can't bury my dad? The next guy surely will do better. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee. I will follow you. But let me first go bid them farewell, which are at my home, at my house. Surely I can say bye to my family. I'm just going to say bye to them. We're going to have a nice dinner. And then, and then I'm yours. I mean, it's going, right? We're there. And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. These are some hard sayings of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the God who loves us. We think, my goodness, Lord, I want to follow you. Sell everything. You might be homeless. 
No, you can't go bury your dad. Go preach the kingdom of God. I want to say bye to my family. No. No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. There's no looking back. The Bible tells us to count the cost of discipleship. Count the cost. If God is all-powerful, if God is everything that he says that he is, is he worthy of those things? Is he worthy of those things? This seems tough, right? Because it is in a sense. Because you will have to deny yourself. Take up the cross and follow him. So how is it that when we get to this place, now listen, where we miss the dinners with our family, And we miss the funerals of our family. And we don't really have much concern for our homes or our possessions because we know they fully belong to God. And we are empowered by Christ to serve him with all power and authority and see the mighty hand of God intervene in this time continuum and blast through destroying sin in people's life and watching bondage fall out left, right, and regular. And we get invigorated and empowered to serve him. And we live that life. We live that life where all of a sudden he's number one and all the possessions belong to him. The worrying about being homeless doesn't even exist, doesn't even come to mind because it's good father and he's providing in every way. You want to preach the kingdom of God. I'm on mission in Haiti. And someone has passed away and I want to be there, but I cannot. I will preach the gospel and I will comfort the family when I come home. If I come home. That's powerful. It's a powerful life of a disciple. It's a blessed life of a disciple. I know it sounds tough, but come with me just a couple of chapters. Because I'm sure the Lord's going to lighten up. Luke 14. In Luke 14, after he gives that message there, which is pretty hard to bear. Now, here's the thing that's kind of amazing to me about the Lord Jesus Christ. He had the opportunity to build a huge church. I mean, you know how many places in Jerusalem they could have rented out or purchased? I mean, they could, have, they could have gone down to Caesarea to the Colosseum and rented it out. I mean, they could have had services every Shabbat, pow, blasting it. Much bigger. Much bigger. And every time the Lord had all these disciples that were coming together, thousands. I mean, he goes and feeds 5,000, says men, not including women and children, with a few fish and a few pieces of bread. Powerful ministry takes place. And all these are gathering together and saying, wow, what a preacher. What a church body that we all get to eat and fellowship. And it's wonderful. And the Lord Jesus Christ, as they're all coming together, goes and preaches the sermon, eat my flesh, drink my blood. Wow, Lord, could you imagine what the disciples were thinking? It's like, man, we had something good going there. And then he goes with the eat my flesh stuff again. The drink my blood sermon. Ah, he knows how these guys feel about blood. The Lord was interested in disciples. And all those that were gathering for some superficial uh, benefits of the gathering, he actually actively worked to see that that they got the message, that they heard what he was saying, that there was a genuine conversion that took place in their life. Here he says in verse 14, uh, uh, chapter 14, verse 26, if any man will come after me, which come after me is what? Follow me. 
If any man will come after me and hate not his father and his mother and his wife and his children and his brethren and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. He cannot be my disciple. Verse 27, and whosoever doth not bear his cross and follow me, come after me, cannot be my disciple. This is the Lord Jesus Christ saying you can't be a disciple. You're not allowed to. It's not going to happen. You can't do it. You can't. You cannot be my disciple if you're not willing to hate yourself and everyone in your family. Yes. He mentions the cross before he was crucified. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. This is where it talks about counting the cost of discipleship right here in the middle before we get to verse 33. He says about building a tower, you have to sit down and count the cost. Look there in verse 28. It says, for which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, the cost of discipleship. In verse 31, he says, or what king going to make war against another king sitteth down not first and consulteth whether he is able with 10,000 men to meet him that cometh against 20,000. In verse 33, he says, So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he has cannot be my disciple. Cannot be my disciple. If we're going to serve the Lord, in 2017, what if, what if we decided to be disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ? Not just I'm saved and I've got my ticket and I don't have to do anything else for the Lord and I'm going to indulge in all this other stuff. But what if, what if we decided that these are the words of Christ and their truth? And then if that, we're not willing to do all these things, then we cannot be his disciple. And we want to follow him. And we want to follow him. What would it look like? We'd be disciple makers, wouldn't we? And we wouldn't be pandering to some group of people that want to hear platitudes. We'd be telling them the heart of the gospel and what it is. A deliverance from sin. In discipleship, Cole, have there been some harsh words said to you? Things that you needed to break off in your life. And you need to make a decision. Amen. That's discipleship. Not, oh, it's okay, you know, and I understand. It's going to be good. There's compassion. But in discipleship, there's some hard words said. Craig, discipleship. Hard words said? Sometimes. Sometimes. You have to make a decision, right? Discipleship. Are you discipling someone right now in your life? Disciples make disciples. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. Listen, you got a whole year ahead of you. Amen? No. It's just now starting. I'm saying, what if you decided that you want to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ? You want to be a follower of the Most High God. You want to know that every provision that comes down from heaven comes to you to be a steward of. And you hold it. Lord, where will you have this go? And it's all outward focused. There's no inward focus to it. The only inward focus you have is a reflection to see if you're in Christ. Is he glorified in your life? Come with me to Matthew chapter 14. We're in Luke 14. It's at the beginning of the Gospels. And this is just in closing. I want to share this with you. I share this message because we are at a crossroad in life. Matthew chapter 14. 
if God's people will not humble themselves, pray, and seek his face, and turn from their wicked ways, he is not going to hear our cries. He is not going to forgive the sin, and he is not going to heal the lands. This is a truth, and we are at a crossroads in life. In your family, the devil is coming in, and he's trying to destroy your family. And I know this, and I pray for you fervently, and it keeps me up at night as I pray for you to fight the good fight of faith in your own families. But I'm telling you right now, if you just root sin out, Banish the demons in the name of Jesus Christ. There will be wholeness in your home so that we can move forward seeking his face and seeing this transformation not only take place in our homes, but take place in our friendships, in our communities, and in this country. We are at a place right now where persecution is going to come so heavily, heavily on every single person that these trivial Things that are going on in your home and in your life and the goodies that you're trying to get are going to not matter at all. Don't you understand? They will have no value unless God's people stand up and stand firm, stand strong in the Lord. He's saying, make disciples. You want to change somebody's mind, a liberal person's mind, change their heart. The only one that can change their heart is Jesus Christ. He's the only one that can change their heart. Jesus Christ and him alone. But the only way they're going to hear about it is some disciple is going to come up and he's going to try and make them one. And so, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few, says the Lord. If we have a real vision of God, in all of his might and all of his glory and all of his power, everything else falls away and seems small. Any endeavor that you make in this life, listen, whatever you're doing, you need to be doing for the glory of Christ. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily unto the Lord and not unto men. Do you have a business? Is that business glorifying God? Do you work for a business? Is that business glorifying God? Whatever you do, do it heartily unto the Lord. This is what we should be about, making disciples. Here's what the Lord says. Something very simple, very neat. And it's in Matthew, uh, did I say 14? Matthew 13. Matthew 13. It's just one back over. Matthew 13, verse 44. This is the Lord, and I love when he shares about the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is like this. The kingdom of heaven is like this. The kingdom of heaven is like this. And here in verse 44, he says, and again, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth. And for joy, therefore goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. We've been talking about keeping our eyes on Jesus, keeping our eyes on Jesus, keeping our eyes on Jesus, seeing him as the ultimate treasure in this life. And here is a man who has gone and wandered into a field. And as he wanders into the field, he finds a treasure, a treasure that he wants with everything he has, so much so that he buries it back up, packs it down, looks around, nobody sees it, and he goes and everything that he has, everything, his home, his clothes, his jewelry, his chariot, everything gets sold. And his friends look at him like he has got to be some kind of weird guy. Some kind of peculiar guy. What are you doing? Why are you selling all your stuff? I'm going to go get the field. The field, that pathetic little field in the middle of nowhere. Why would you do all this? This looks strange because he knows the treasures that's there. And he goes and he takes all of that, which now seems like nothing, nothing to him. He would walk around in the skivvies to get all the money that he need to buy this plot of land. That's the kingdom of heaven. Is that the kingdom of heaven for you? Is that the kingdom of heaven where it's, it's more precious than anything else in this life and that nothing else seems to matter 
It's all about obtaining that glory, that treasure. Here's how the Lord feels. He says in verse 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he has found one pearl of grace, great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. The kingdom of heaven is like unto this merchant man. And this merchant man is the Lord Jesus Christ, God Almighty. Seeking goodly pearls, he finds you. Who when he found one pearl of great price, being yourself, went and sold all that he had, all the glory, all the power, all the majesty of heaven, stepped away from all of that, becoming completely man. He came and bought you. He came and purchased you. Does that bring any joy to your heart? Does that bring any joy to your heart to know that God, the Lord of glory, would come down and do all that for us? even to sacrifice his own self on a cross, suffering the punishment that we deserved, bearing all sin upon himself so that you could be purchased, bought, clean, free. Does that bring any amount of joy to you? This is the joy that we want to bring to a dying world. And when we get caught up with all kinds of other stuff in our lives, bogging us down, we lose that. We lose sight of the real meaning of this life. And this life is for you and I to make disciples. And for us to be disciples, there should be disciples in our life that we're working with and working on. I think that, that this place will not Hold the number of people. If every single one of us went out declaring today that these things of this world pale in comparison to the treasures of heaven and considering all that he's done for me, the least I can do being my reasonable service is to live a life of sacrifice for him. What would it look like in your family for you to go radically in there claiming the name of Jesus Christ, proclaiming him? Well, they might disband you. And this is where the Lord says, hate your father and your mother. Listen, it's not about just hating them. You just love him more than them. When, we, when I loved my wife more than I loved Christ, you were miserable, weren't you? <laughs> miserable. When I began to love Christ, she's happy to take second place to him. And there is a blessing that comes with that. I'm telling you, I had to love him more than I love my wife. Because saying I love my wife, I realized I love myself. I love my own problems. Love Christ. This is what a true disciple is. A true disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Share this word with somebody, amen? Share this good news. The good news is that we're already condemned. And Jesus Christ came. And paid the punishment for us that we could have freedom. That we could have freedom in Christ. Amen? Would you bow your heads with me? Amazingly enough in the scriptures, I don't see many places where a person bows their head and prays a prayer. George Whitfield would preach to thousands of people. And he was asked... How many got saved today? And he said, we'll see in about six months or a year. We'll see. Because disciples will make disciples. And we'll see them. They'll make themselves known. I want this message to be an encouragement to you just to self-reflect. To look at your relationship with the Lord. To see... As David prayed, is there any wicked way in me? Search my heart. Try me. Know my thoughts. See if there's any wicked way in me. Am I selfish? 
have I placed something higher than you, Lord? Whatever it is, the Holy Spirit is faithful to reveal that to you. And you can ask him today to root it out of your life, to make you afresh, to strengthen you in the inner man, the spirit of your being, to give you deliverance, to give you freedom, to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ and make disciples. Precious Heavenly Father, God, we thank you. Lord, just in, in this moment, allow your Holy Spirit to minister to each person here. Revealing. Repenting. Regenerating. Reigniting. Thank you, Lord, for your deliverance. Thank you, Lord, for your power. Thank you for you have all power and authority over all things in my life. I want to turn my eyes on you and you alone. All these other things... Why would I place such heavy value in them? Help me to understand that you want good for me. But it is placing you first that brings this goodness. Lord, I've tried to hold on to different things. They crumble in my hands. And I crushed them in the other one. Oh God, that you would make yourself afresh in our hearts. That your glory would come down. You are the only God that will do that. Pair the broken heart. Bind up the wounded, O oh Lord. Set the captives free, Lord Jesus. Give us hope. Give us an expected future. In Jesus' name. And God's people say, Amen. Amen.